So we are live. Good afternoon, everybody. Meeting on the USA, Rebuilding Trust. Our topic of discussion today is repurposing of the suite. To be moderating this panel today, which includes such an extraordinary and highly talented group of with some thought-provoking and tantalising concepts, ideas and opinions. So make sure you hang around until the end. Rodriguez and I am the founder and CEO of Iconic R&D, an international award-winning social enterprise on a global mission to help people retain their teeth for life through the development of oral health care products and services that are healthier, sustainable at the core of our DNA is the belief that oral health is a basic human right and that every person on the planet deserves access to products and services like tooth decay, gum disease and oral cancers. I am absolutely delighted to introduce you to our panel this afternoon. Each person have approximately three minutes to share with you their opinions on the topic. First of all, we'll have Cindy Gallup, the founder and CEO of Day. Cindy's background is brand building, marketing and advertising and in 2003 was named Advertising Woman of the Year. She's the founder and CEO of IfWeRanTheWorld.com, a radically simple web meets world intentions into action, one micro action at a time. Cindy is also the founder of Make Love Not Porn. Cindy also consults for brands and clients who want to change the game in their particular sector. And she's well known Michael Bay of business. Thank you, Cindy. It's such a pleasure to have you on the panel today. Founder of I'm Madre Ventures here. USA. I believe Laura has been having... Oh. Um... Laura Walker Lee is the founder of Madre Ventures USA. I believe she's having a little bit of problem, so um, we may or may not be able to hear community and trust within the entertainment and finance industries. In 2020, she launched Madre Ventures, which strategic support to early stage and mid cap enterprises that are solving significant social, environmental, and technological challenges thesis is what would it look like to help 1 billion people and it seeks to support that thesis through the verticals of green energy, mindful technology and social justice. In addition, Laura is the co-founder and CEO of AG Capital, a fund that focuses on the advancement of culture by way of world-class creators, impactful storytelling and unique like events. Pleasure to have you on board today, Laura. And he is the CEO of Toda Network. Tufi is CEO of Privacy Shell and Chair of Practitioner Board Conference Committee. Tufi's background is mainly machine learning, decentralised governance, distributed computing and crypto. Sorry, cryptography. He's Toda's protocol co-author. He has authored and co-authored several algorithms, protocols and patents. Um, his company that's for software that he built from ground up. Some have ended up at Google, HP and Intel. Currently, he runs a startup for SEC advisory with Todd Gebert, ex-co-president of McAfee and vice chairman of Intel Security, and Dan Tolliver, ex-NASA Seashell Corp with offices in San Francisco, Palo Alto and Toronto. Toronto. Treasured mail on the panel today. <laughs> um, next we have Deborah Wang of USA. Deborah is a serial entrepreneur with 20 years experience in founding companies as a member of the executive corporate She began her career as a lawyer after graduating from UC Berkeley School of Law, specialising in corporate securities law. 
Since then, she has started successful high-tech companies, raised hundreds of millions for her companies, and made sizable returns for shareholders. ...who constantly strives for greater achievements. Equally important is her dedication to helping others. She's the CEO of King housing for the homeless, elderly and disabled. She is also the chairman of Praise the Lord Foundation, a cross-continental organisation that aids children lacking proper educational facilities and supplies missionaries in need of financial support. Her goal is to give light to the world. Thank you for shining your beautiful light, Deborah. And um, finally, but not least, is Eva Lota a member of the supervisory board, Metro Germany. Eva is a CEO, board member and senior advisor with extensive leadership experience, having led a global 1 billion euro digital transformation at IKEA. Successful leadership in growth and turnaround across diverse cultures, Japan, China, Europe and the US. Strong understanding of the end customer. Worked with privately owned private equity as well as listed companies. Global brands from Metro AG to George Jensen span from mid-market to luxury. Eva is passionate about sustainable business. So before we commence with our first panellist, Cindy Gallup, um, I think you'd all have to agree we have an incredible... Uh, I believe you're in Europe, everybody else is in the US and I'm in Australia, so um, good for you. <laughs> it's for um, so before we commence um, with our panel, one thing is for certain, in a world that is patriarchal and capitalist, there seems to be a disconnect from the heart. Heart-centred values, values that uplift the human spirit is what's unravelling. And no change is not an option. Um, at the realm of heart-centred leadership is self-awareness an authentic self and therefore leading through an authentic power, a gentler, kinder power. A study on the Lean In Org in 2020 titled Women in the Workplace, which builds on the same titled reports from 2015 to 20 crisis and uncertainty, corporate America is at crossroads. The choices companies make today will have The data set from the report reflects contributions from 317 companies that participated 50,000 people surveyed on their workplace experiences. The events of 2020 have turned under the highly challenging circumstances of COVID-19 pandemic, many employees are struggling to do their jobs. Women in particular have been negatively impacted. Women, especially of colour, are more likely to have been laid off or furloughed during the COVID-19 crisis, stalling their careers and jeopardising their financial security. A pan the pandemic has intensified challenges that women already face. As a result, more than one in four women are contemplating what many would have considered unthinkable just six months ago, downshifting their careers and leaving an emergency for corporate America, companies risk losing women in leadership and future women leaders and unwinding years of painstaking progress towards gender diversity. The crisis also represents an opportunity if companies make significant investments in building a more flexible and equitable happening, they can retain the employees most affected by today's crisis and nurture a culture in which women over the long term. To the panel, our discussion is around repurposing the C-suite for diversity. It has long been male preserved. Even today, there are only 6% um, female CEOs. There are female presidents. What is going on here? And what is the general resistance to female appointments? Um, Cindy, over to you. Thank you, Ingrid. Thoughts, ideas, so, opinions about this. So um, I think it's very important that our panel today focuses on the solutions and the benefits of diversity in the C-suite. And 
you know, I've been interviewed regularly throughout the pandemic by reporters who are writing a story about why women leaders have led their countries far more effectively through the pandemic than male leaders have. And I've been at great pains to, to set them right on a myth that is out there about why that is. Because the reason women leaders have been so much more successful than men in leading through the pandemic has nothing to do with, oh, being a woman means you're more touchy-feely, you're more empathetic, you're more warm. That's absolute rubbish. The reason women leaders have been more effective is because by the time a woman gets to the top of the political tree in her country, in her state, in her nation, what she has had to go through to get there means that she's bloody amazing at what she does and she's a phenomenal leader because she has had to overcome the barriers of sexism, sexual harassment, racism, if she is of color, um, you know, mansplaining, condescension, um, patronizing that actually manage a ton more women out of politics and never make, make it to the top. By the time you're at the top, you're a phenomenal leader, way more so than the men who never had to face any of the barriers you did to get to a position of political power. And so it's worth bearing in mind that when you are looking at potential female leaders for the C-suite, the women in the candidate pool, by sheer definition of being there alone, um, have so much talent at their disposal that they absolutely need to be given the opportunity to lead. And it's especially important because there is huge benefit to men when the C-suite is diverse, because men need brilliant female leadership role models just as much as women do. The saying, you cannot be what you cannot see, applies to men just as much as it does to women. Men do not learn different ways of leadership, different ways of working, different ways of being when the only role models they have in front of them are other men. Um, and in fact, I will just um, give a plug for my and Thomas Hamora Premuzik's Harvard Business Review article, Seven Leadership Lessons Men Can Learn from Women, which I would love our listeners to check out. Um, but essentially, what all of this boils down to is that we live in a society and a world and a business world where the default setting is always male. Men, you have no idea how much happier you would be living and working in a world and a business world and a corporate world where you get to learn from brilliant women, you're led by brilliant women, and women from the C-suite are creating a completely different working world and culture in which you will be much happier, as will everybody, women, people of color, LGBTQ, the disabled alike. So that is why I believe that we will all benefit from more diversity in the C-suite. <laughs> well, so passionate, Cindy, um, especially about bringing in this sort of um, different work operating, encompassing everyone that you sort of um, spoke about. Um, we have, uh, I did have one from Cindy um, just because. Um, she was bringing the sort of corporate, corporate social responsibility should be more about corporate social. I have lost her. So I'm going to move on to you, Tufi. Um, and you bring just a completely different um, per perception or set of eyes to, to this um, equation. Um, and I did have to sort of speak with you about it a little bit. So, um, you know, for you're very much wanting to speak about the globally corporate governance is predominantly male oriented, but um, in, you want us to consider artificial intelligence um, to be a lot more powerful than anything created on this planet. Um, and it's the biggest threat to its governance. Can you please speak to that? Absolutely. Um, so, um,
now more than ever. And, and, and this isn't something that, uh, uh, I just, uh, you know, trying to sell fear or whatnot. I have 96 jobs that I, each and every one of them would make me money. This is my 97th thing that is not about money. It's about making truly this world a better place that we can live in for us and for, for next generation. Uh, uh the, the companies run the world today. And if, if that statement, somebody has some issues with it that, oh, not true. Maybe some governments, they sell around the world. We know where we're heading, that companies are going to be running the world more and more every single day. The governance of those companies, male. Okay. You know, maybe what's the problem with that? Well, AI today can enable people to do certain things, but we're approaching that moment where AI is a trillion times more powerful than any human being. The AGI is around the corner, and we are very close to get to that uh, point. Who runs this AI until we figure out a method to have AI not to be repurposed? Those who run AI, they are those companies that we all love and cherish. And I'm being sarcastic here. Okay, so... I, I don't know if anyone, uh, whether uh, any homo sapien want to live in a world where it's like run by something that it, it has trillion times more power than the human being, and it's mainly male. So the same problem that got to be that male, those are going to be the ones that they're actually running this planet with trillion times more power. So I want to leave any listener to imagine that. And when I say trillion, you might think it's exaggerating. Ask any AI scientist, are we heading there? Absolutely, we are heading there. Who runs it? Who manages it? Companies. Trillion times more power. That means we have trillion times more power than the chicken. If turning this planet into chicken farm and hum humanity into chicken until we figure out how we, we, we get to the point where we cannot repurpose AI, those that are running the planet, there are those very few that they are majority male for the same problem that they got to be majority male. And I, and I can say my, from my own perspective, and I feel every homo sapiens should feel from their own perspective. You grew up in a home where you felt that like you, you have, you know, your mother, your father, or whoever your, your garden is. And did you want to ever feel that you're growing up in a place where it's like over 90% is governed by, by male? And I, I know the answer to that. And you know the answer to that. And the necessity right now is a trillion times more than ever. So I really feel that that need should be, uh, you know, uh, to, to address this issue. Uh, it could be an existential threat. People, they might not see that as existential threat. I've been in AI all my life, in cryptography all my life. I look at attack vectors. And when, when giving this much power to very few, and those very few, their governance has that, that, that problem, I think we need to address that ASAP. And, uh, you know, I, if, if, if anyone would feel that, they, that there's more motive for it, please reach out. I'm approachable on LinkedIn, anywhere. I'm so sorry. Something happened with the connection. Um, Tufi, that was very passionately spoken and um, very thought provoking indeed. Um, and I think I could sort of um, hear you speak for quite some time about this um, and very concerning at the same time. Now, Deborah, um, next to you, you were shaking your head a lot. So, um, were there some things that you could sort of agree with what Tufi was saying? And then, what's your perspective? Um, on sort of the diversity of, you know, repurposing the, the C-suite. Yeah, yeah, good. Good afternoon, everyone. So, so um, based on my research, according to the majority American, actually, uh, the majority of American find that we capable of being good political and corporate leader as men. But why the such a short supply of women at the top position in the business and government in the United States? What are the reasons holding women back from those top positions? Uh, the reasons, you know, I, I found are the following. Number one, 
women are held at a higher standard. Women typically feel that they need to work harder and that they need to Even though the majority of Americans find that women are as capable as being a good political and corporate leaders, however, the majority of Americans are not ready to elect or to hire women leaders due to gender bias and the gender stereotyping. And number three, family responsibility don't leave enough time. We all know women have been historically disadvantaged with the burden of child care. So when career interruption related to motherhood make it more difficult for women to advance in career and compete for top executive positions. According to recent Q Research Center on survey on women and leadership, the men as being a compassionate and organized leader. When it comes to leadership traits specifically applied to political leadership, women are perceived to have a clear advantage over men. Five key areas. Number one, working out compromise. Women politicians are better at working out compromise than their male counterparts. Number two, being on ethical. Number three, working to improve the quality of life for Americans. And finally, standing up for people in spite of political pressure. Okay, thank you. That's my observation. Wow. Um, I just, uh, just even just hearing Deborah now, like every single um, speaker today is it's extremely passionate. Um, about this topic and, um, you know, talking about gender bias and, you know, how this affects affects um, advancing in career and, you know, um, even Cindy talking about sexism and, you know, all these issues that women encounter um, as we um, move up the corporate ladder, I guess. Um, Eva, I'm curious to know from you, um, along your journey as CEO in different companies and in different countries, um, can you please share some of your trials and tribulations and have you felt held back from a senior position and have you experienced um, gender bias, you know, um, sexism, etc.? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I thought maybe it could be interesting to tell my story. Being one of the 6%, I think, of women who who are part of the C-suite and, and worked as a CEO in different countries and different companies the last years. And definitely it hasn't always been an easy ride, that's for sure. Um, I, I would say though, uh, with my background, I'm Scandinavian and I, I worked in Japan, I worked in, in, uh, in different parts of the world simply. So different cultures have met me. But one thing that always had said stay very true to me in myself and my heart is really a sense of self. So whether I'm a woman or a man or whatever, I, I, I know myself and if I don't, I try to find out. So whenever, you know, things like that hits me, it could be any of the things you described, if I would be insecure about the sense of myself where my heart truly lies and my brain and my gut connected, I would probably be quite lost. So I think uh, a way to, to, to uh, I wouldn't use, it's easy to use the word succeed, but the way to grow, the way to be a human being that are very happy with your life and, and feel that you can contribute. For me, it has been very much about whenever those things have happened to me, whether I'm now on the boards, I'm on, on some quite big boards uh, in Europe, uh, global boards, or when I was a CEO, for example, in, in, in Germany or in, uh, in the Netherlands or so on. Um, I think I've always questioned, you know, my, my way of and my, my characteristics. Do I feel empathy? Can I deliver to stakeholders? And if I do so, how do I do it? 
am I interested in people? Do I love people? Yes, I do love people. And I want, you know, my purpose in my life has always been to connect, inspire people. And, you know, when you have people, you know, close to you in an organization and you can see them thrive, you know, they can find out something about themselves. And the closer they get privately, you know, into that and don't have a work face and a home face, but more, you know, interact with this is who I am and I'm okay and I can grow in my way. That's, you know, when I get goosebumps and wants to be a leader and a CEO. Um, so I'm trying not to focus too much on, you know, what's not good because it's there. But if you see, if I keep focusing on that, I'm going to be dragged down and I don't want to be that. So what I've took a decision of is I've been, I've been counting recently because I've written a book. So I've been a leader for 10,000 days. And after those 10,000 days, I've decided to join <laughs> and give my legacy from the purpose I'm in. I want to give a legacy now to the next generation. So what I'm doing now, I'm putting all my time into helping to connect and inspire you know, more people, more diverse people, women, absolutely. But also, you know, the, the mindset of leaders who want to know themselves and take responsibility, both to deliver to stakeholders, have a vision, know their purpose and constantly evolving in, you know, connecting to people and, and deliver to that. And if you're missing one of those three things, you probably shouldn't be a leader. <laughs> very well said <laughs> um wow this has been absolutely incredible um a couple of things that you sort of mentioned there eva um brought me back to um back in australia i was um in a seminar at the australian institute of management um and there were ceos and senior management from um various organizations but on my table there was um, a senior manager um, from a pharmaceutical company a, a global um, multinational and um, it was on happiness and um, you know and he loved the program he said I can't wait to get back to where I'm going to implement this amongst all my staff um, and um, it's going to be wonderful. And I sort of turned around to him and I said, um, but you have to do it too. Like it has to start with you and filter down into your organisation, not at bottom and filter up. And he sort of looked at me and he said, what do you mean? I have to do it. <laughs> I was like, absolutely, you know, and he was just absolutely um, distraught at this idea of having to participate and go through this self-awareness because it was all related to self-awareness, Eva, is what you were mentioning. And um, one thing I want to sort of um, bring to the group, and Tofi, it's great to have you on board because I'd like to know the male perspective. Um, one thing that I have experienced as a CEO and, and I'm, I'm not sure if everyone else has, but it's this imposter syndrome, you know, of, you know, who am I or, you know, a bit like what you're saying, Eva, we, we start to question ourselves and our capabilities. Um, how do we overcome that? Um, because I think that, that is part of that sort of um, owning our Um, sure. So, um, so my take on that is that there is no such thing as imposter syndrome. And the reason for that um, is, and, and this is very much picking up on what Deborah said earlier, um, my um, occasional writing collaborator, Thomas Hamora Primzik, um, wrote um, eight years ago now the single most read article on the Harvard Business Review uh, back in 2013. It's an article that is called, Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders? And the premise of Tomas's article is that we focus, quite rightly, as we are currently, on the many, many obstacles that are put in the way of brilliant women. But a far bigger issue 
is the lack of obstacles for incompetent men. Just as Deborah was saying. And by the way, that article was so popular, Tomas has now turned into a book. So please buy his book. It's called Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders and How to Fix It? And I blurbed it and I said, this is the single most important business leadership book of our time, because it is. Because it's very, very simple. Um, if you want more brilliant women in the C-suite, stop promoting incompetent men into it. Don't focus on, on what we need to do about ourselves. We are all a damn sight more brilliant than we ever give ourselves credit for. Focus instead on pulling the career ladder out from under the incompetent men who do not deserve the endless promotions, endless pay raises, endless bonuses, and are promoted into a position that they are completely incapable of filling, simply because at the top of every industry is a closed loop of white guys talking to white guys about other white guys. And so, you know, to overcome this female myth of imposter syndrome, I regularly tell women, I want you to bullshit like the men do. And I explain that what I mean by that is I feel very confident telling women to bullshit like men do because no matter how much you think you're bullshitting, you will never bullshit at the level men do. When you think you're doing that, all you're doing is you are finally <laughs> doing yourself justice. You are finally promoting yourself the way you should be. And so that's my response, Ingrid. There is no such thing as imposter syndrome when we stop promoting incompetent men and allow women, as Ava says quite rightly, to be what we are, which is so massively needed in the C-suite. Beautiful. Um, very nice. Tofu, I'm, I'm curious about your comments in relation to that so I guess that the biggest thing I got from from what Cindy just said is to stop promoting incompetent men um what's your take on that and the imposter syndrome that I was speaking about well, earlier? Well, well well I think if if we don't do what uh, Cindy's suggesting then I'm a lot more uh confident that we are facing an existential threat uh effectively we're, just try to envision something that is a trillion times more powerful than this thing on the right, but it's managed by incompetent somebody, okay? Just try to imagine that. And, 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 and the easiest way to imagine that, like us, a human, and the, and the chicken, or, or the ants, okay? We have this much more power. Now imagine, for some reason, the one that's managing you when you are facing the ants or like the chicken is an actual chicken, is the one controlling you. So that is the inc incompetent that is running this thing that has a trillion times more power. Do you want to live in this in this world? And and it's just it's uh, I think it's from my perspective I, I really want to emphasize how much we need to, to fix this issue ASAP. Um, I'm I'm totally like uh, on board with uh, you know Frank wouldn't have put me on this uh, the, this panel if I wasn't like 100 percent on board with with what the, the reasons of wh wh why we're doing this and the problems and so on and so forth. But I really want to add this additional reason. I'm really, really hoping that this additional reason would would would, uh, would, would sit in the back of each and every one of us and would be like, what kind of world do we want to live in in 2030 or 2032 or 40? We're approaching it. This is that, it's that close, okay, that, that that's going to be run by those incompetent folks. I don't. Yeah. I don't think neither one of us would want that world. So let's let's address it ASAP. I think it's uh, we can do something about it. And I feel like uh, many topics that get discussed here at Horasis, people would think that they're not going anywhere. Believe me, I've been around a few times. They do get somewhere. So I don't know how it goes magically. Maybe all the, the, the power people combined, <laughs> uh, adding a little bit of. Frank's uh, taste into it, but it's, it happens. So let's let's be optimistic about it, and I and I am. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tofi. And I um, I love the journey that you take when say imagine, imagine, you know, and it's just very graphic. So um, thank you for for um drawing a picture, I guess, of of what that could be, and it is quite frightening. Um, to Eva and Deborah, I'm. Cindy and, and Tufi have said, um, I remember once um, hearing that um, 
about Mother Teresa and she was asked to um, participate in a march against the war in Vietnam. Um, and she declined to do so, but she said, but if you create a march for peace, I'll be there. So taking that into consideration, um, you know, it's a systemic problem that we're experiencing um, in this sort of gender diversity uh, in the corporate suite. But I want to know, um, is the resolution, can we find something that's already broken or do we need to sort of start educating our children at this grassroots level, level so that we can bring up younger men um, and women to understand about gender bias and sexism and diversity, um, you know, at that core level so that we can bring up more sort of well-balanced human beings into, you know, 2030, 2040 and so forth. Eva, I'd like to know your take on that. Well, um, I don't think it's that completely broken, but I do. forward when it comes to to both diversity and, and other things so, so that's where I come from um, and I do think as I said earlier my my shift in my life I've stopped being a CEO I've stopped working operational in that sense and I now devote all my time to the boards yes I do that to stay relevant in the business context but you know just to help and guide and find these young people and, and, and don't say, you know, young is the right and old is not, but just to encompass both of them. Because, of course, there is a lot of great men and women that can, you know, help this younger generation to give them hope, to give them hope that, you know, there is leadership. And how does that look like? And in that case, I think one of the most effective ways is to show good examples, role models, examples, how it could be done, not just to talk about it, but actually show people have done something profoundly good and to inspire the younger generation and to guide them to find their way of doing something in that direction. So, and for that, you need to scale. You need to be able to go out and, and be able to scale your message and to find people. And there, I think, going back to technology and so on, as we, we touched upon today in, in, a, in a different way, obviously, but I think the ability to go out and connect today through technology, to find people in Places like, you know, I, I, I reached around to, to places where normally people are not so seen uh, in the eastern part of Europe, in, in poorer parts of Europe. I'm, I'm quite engaged in Ukraine these days and the talent pool, you know, that's there. It's amazing in a very corrupt society. So, you know, you can do a lot by by uh, devoting your time to it. But role models, uh, global reach, go beyond your own neighborhood and try to really you know, embrace those people and give them guidance and help in, in how they can find their unique way. Mm. Thank you. Deborah, did you want to add to that? Microphone's off, Deborah. Microphone. Oh, yeah, okay. So I think I, I, I definitely, I believe to... Uh, to resolve the problem of gender bias and the gender stereotyping, we need to start from education. Because, uh, you know, like from education, for example, uh, people always, I mean, the, I think kids always think, of, like, for example, astronauts, they are all men. You know, I think just there are those historical, uh, you know, story, uh, all those leaders are all men. So, uh, women have been, his, uh, like, since uh, they were little, from education, from elementary school, uh, they just start feel like, okay, men should be the leader. So I think that there should be a program, educational program in the school to implement from elementary school, have a lead, women leader to be in the role model to work with the kids, let them know, okay, so let them know, you know, women can be the leader rather than just based on whatever historical, uh, you know, always men are the leader. Like, for example, astronauts always are men, right? So actually women can also be astronaut right so so i definitely believe uh, to overcome the, this uh gender bias gender stereotyping we should start from education and from you know elementary school you know and the, uh, the school should have a program to involve with women as a role model to work with girls at the school 
That is wonderful. Um, I've just been told that we've got a uh, very short time to wind up. So um, I'd like to thank each and every one of um, the panellists, Cindy, Tofu, uh, Deborah and Eva. Um, it does look optimistic and I think that is um, the way to look at things. Uh, we know what the problems are, but we need to start having different conversations on what the changes are and how we move forward. Um, the more that we talk about that, the more we, we manifest that. I do believe that. So in just a closing, um, if I could have um, one optimistic comment um, from each um, and every one of you about... Um, uh, what does the world look like for you um, in 2050? Okay, well, to, um, I'll, um, I'll start in that case. And I'll just say <laughs> that from um, my side, um, I'm recommending to everybody that when we champion diversity, equality, and inclusion, all its forms, we lead with the least represented segment of our society, which is black women. Black women are doing extraordinary things to get us out of the shit we're in here in the United States of America, as everyone knows. And so in 2050, I want to see so many black female leaders and black, a black female president in the US and you know, to, um, black women leading the charge for women of color and women everywhere. And I believe that we will absolutely get to, get to that world because all of us, including this wonderful panel, are making that happen. Thank you. Um, Tofi. 2050, uh, you're saying optimistic. Well, I'm in cybersecurity. I usually look at all the possibilities for bad things and try to prevent them. So sometimes when I talk about the future, people will be like, why are you so <laughs> pessimistic, Mike? Because we're trying to prevent that future. Uh, but, but I'm certainly optimistic that we can. Um, and I feel uh, I'm honored to be amongst uh, all of you here because this is one uh, extremely necessary. It, of course, we all know that's not uh, sufficient for like it prevent a lot of existential threat. But if we don't address that, I, I don't think we're going to be able to make it. Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, challenge me. But it, I'm talking about existential threat here. Okay. So when we say that we have something a trillion times more power than uh, humanity, this is basically a lot more powerful than nuclear warheads. And uh, to back to the example that we talked about earlier, do you want the one who's running the, the button on nuclear war has to be that chicken because that's where we're heading towards, okay? Do we want that chicken to be running a nuclear war heads? Oh, okay, because like I happen to be a leader because some sort of like whatever hormonal things. I don't think so. I think uh, this is one essential thing that we need to address it and I really hope that by 2050 we get to the point where we can see that this world is... Uh, if, if I were to choose with the 100% honesty, I tell you, it's my opinion. If I were to choose, we were not to have like certain equality in the, in, in, in the governance of this planet, I'm 100% would choose like women to run the planet as opposed to men, okay? That's me, okay? Now, why, why would I do that? I mean, I've seen a lot. I've been around the, the world many times and uh, I grew up in a war. I've seen my mom going through a lot of stuff, my sisters, my grandmother, all of these things. Uh, that, that, that's my opinion, but I'm extremely optimistic we're going to get there. Thank you. <laughs> and um, Eva? Yeah, I, I, I just want to say I, I have high hopes that we all have a strong sense that we're all connected in a global world and, and, and are against polarizing things because you want to win something for yourself. Um, I, I, I truly hope and, and strive for and, and dream of a world that people love humanity and people and, and can connect um, to, to build something together. And uh, I'm going to be naively forcing that going, going forward. And, and I think that's the only way to do it, actually. That's what I hope for. Wonderful. And last but not very least, Deborah. Yeah, I think in 2050, I would like to see the situation gender equality has been improved. For example, as I mentioned, women has, uh, you know, great, a uh, clear advantage over men in, as a political leader in the, you know, in the 
political area. However, women did not have the uh, equal representation as men at the political sector. So I'd like to see in 2050, women have the same, at least the same equal representation at the political at the government. Beautiful. Well, that um, brings our session to an end. Thank you to each and every one of you. Um, it's been an absolute delight to moderate this session um, and you've certainly given me a lot to sort of think about. Um, and uh, I too, like everybody on the panel, am very hopeful and optimistic about the future. And uh, let's sort out those 